Good evening. I guess it's it's kind of late afternoon at this point. Um, welcome to Writers Here and Now. Thank you so much to everyone who is here. Today, we have the honor of welcoming back Alyssa Washuda, who earned a BA in English from the University of Maryland in 2007. Um, her honors project was directed by Maud Casey way back when. Um, thank you so much, Alyssa, for coming back and sharing your work and time with us today. Um, on behalf of the Creative Writing Program, the Jimenez Porter Writers House, and Center for Literary Imperative Studies Anti-Racism Series, I'd like to thank the sponsors and collaborators who have made this event possible. The Department of English, the CLCS co-directors, Tita Chico and Karen Nelson, the College of Arts and Humanities, our Marketing and Communications Coordinator, Rosie Grant, graduate students, Yahaira Galvez and Liam Daly, and finally, our deepest gratitude to Professor of Electrical Engineering, Robert Newcomb, for his continued support. The English Department, the Creative Writing Program, and the Jimenez Porter Writers House acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people, who were among the first in the Western Hemisphere. This indigenous land was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We make this acknowledgement out of our respect to the Piscataway elders and ancestors past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here at the University of Maryland. Alyssa will be introduced by Myasia Grimes. After the reading, Myasia will moderate a conversation with Alyssa and then will field questions from the audience. Myasia. Today, I have the honor of welcoming Alyssa Washuda back to UMD, where she received her bachelor's in 2007 to read an excerpt from her forthcoming nonfiction book, White Magic. In reading White Magic and preparing for this conversation, which I expect to be indeed magical, I was struck by the writer I had the privilege to encounter. Washuda is able to spin together disparate threads linking Pokemon Go, Twin Peaks, and Red Dead Redemption 2 to her struggles with men, witchcraft, power, the past, the land, and the body she inhabits. Her language enchants and encants a sort of prayer with each passage, a prayer that honors the difficulty of becoming, maintaining, loving, knowing, and trusting. This book is honest, even when you wish it wasn't, winks even when it's at its most keen and is fully devoted to its project. It can be a rare thing to find a book that seems so completely attuned to what one needs, but I must admit in reading this book, I found a companion that is already and will continue to carry me through. Alyssa Washuda is a member of the Cowlitz Indian tribe and a nonfiction writer. She is the author of My Body is a Book of Rules and Starvation Mode and White Magic is forthcoming from 10 House Books in April. Alongside Teresa Warburton, she is the co-editor of the anthology Shapes of Native Nonfiction, Collective Essays, Collected Essays by Contemporary Writers. She's a National Endowments for the Arts Fellowship recipient, a Creative Capital awardee, and an assistant professor of creative writing at The Ohio State University. Thank you, Alyssa, and welcome. Thank you so much, Maesha. It was so um, nice to see all of you. I wish I were in College Park visiting with you, but I'll just have to come back as soon as I can. Um, I just have, you know, so many, um, as I, I started as an assistant professor at Ohio State a few years ago, and the more time I spend with MFA students um, and, and my undergrads, the more I think about UMD and I think about how much I learned um, about 
creative writing and how you know excellent my education in reading was. Um, I owe so much to UMD English. I really appreciate you all, and um, I hope I'll be able to come back soon once once I'm you know going around maybe for the paperback tour or something like that. Um, so I'm going to read um, from White Magic. Um, I was gonna, I was originally gonna read the, the first essay um, in the book, but I think it's a little, I wanna read one that's a, a little bit funnier and happier um, at the end. This is called My Heartbreak Workbook. Um, I'll give you a little bit of backstory. Um, this essay I think was the first that I wrote that like really took the book writing process in the direction that it was eventually going to go. When I wrote this, this essay, the first draft of it, you know, I did not, um, I thought at that point that I wasn't even sure if I was going to be a writer anymore. I was struggling so much with, you know, my second full length book. It had been years that I was working on it. And I, it wasn't that I didn't know what I was doing. It's that I knew too well what I was doing and I didn't like it. Um, and then I got to um, this horrible pain point in um, a relationship, a breakup, um, and just started writing and remembered why I do it. Um, I'm going to adjust my shades so I can get my lighting situation a little better and not be in shadow. All right, so this is called My Heartbreak Workbook. Um, it begins with an epigraph and it has quite a few epigraphs in it from the same book. Understanding the nature of your wound is the key to your healing for it has affected all your behavior, your decisions and your life choices, especially in the arena of intimate relationships. It is the healing of our wounds that we seek consciously or not, in committed relationships. That's from Keeping the Love You Find, A Personal Guide by Harville Hendricks, PhD. The internet says nobody will love me until I learn to love myself, but the internet never gives instructions. I told myself, I love you, but I was thinking, you're the worst. Nothing would change my mind. What a terrible impasse. The bookstore self-help section though said something different. Nobody will love me until I engage in sequential self-exploration exercises. Hendrix's self-help book for wounded singles says there is a riddle wrapped around my heart. I have a highlighter, a composition book and a pen. I have time. I do not have any better ideas. I'm realizing um, that the version I have in my, my uh, advanced review copy is actually um, an old version with longer epigraphs that I had to cut out um, because I couldn't get permission to use them. <laughs> Rather than trying to find the electronic version of the, the rewrite I did, I will, I will read you the, um, the, the bootleg version of this essay. <laughs> Quote, each bite of information is stored, each word, deed, or action that has trickled down into the unconscious. Your pattern forming brain organizes these myriad bits into a complex shadowy picture, very much like a computer generated image in which each tiny pixel finds a place. Impressions are combined and superimposed one upon another, one upon another into a shimmering apparition of the person who will make me whole." End quote from Hendrix. The last few years have been like this, a cord of twined images of white boys with plastic glasses and plaid shirts and bad posture and two thirds full pints on outdoor bar tables. My finger presses into a flattened mouth to pull it left or right. I could build a man in my sleep. Look, Whiskey and IPAs, 
Snowboarding is my life. Been single for a while now due to avoidance of drama, but I'm ready to put myself back out there for the right girl. Nice guy, not a serial killer. LOL, looking for my partner in crime. Bourbon and scotch. The kid is my niece. Just moved back to the Northwest, taking applications for a travel companion. Enjoy a healthy and active lifestyle. I have near perfect straight teeth for never having braces and have no clue why I don't smile with my teeth. Craft beer enthusiast, not here for hookups. Podcasts, adventures, movies, guitars, hiking, whiskey, dogs, Star Wars, sushi, snack plates, coffee, wine, motorcycles, dancing, drinks, travel, positive vibes, minimalism, bacon, passion. Looking for a discreet lover. Must be fit and in shape. I want us to be like an old Nintendo console. Blow on it hard and shove it back in the slot. School of Hard Knocks, the University of Life. Six foot one if it matters. Polly dude with a big heart. I want to beat you at pool. Caring, compassionate, level-headed, drama-free, honest, loyal, humble, passionate, easygoing, funny, adventure-seeking, and so on. Looking for a wife to start a family colony. 420 friendly. I love the outdoors. I am that serial killer you have been looking for. LOL, JK. I enjoy meeting people and going out and trying new things. I like to be active, but also enjoy staying in. Follow your passion, be prepared to work hard and sacrifice, and above all, don't let anyone limit your dreams. Must love dogs, be low maintenance, and love hiking. Living every day like it's my last. I like beautiful smiles. I'm a good guy, good job, not an asshole. I love exotic women and different cultures. What's your fantasy? Growing old, but never up. Dream big, work hard, die living. It's like a game. Each match as dopamine rich as a sunk ski ball. Congratulations, you have a new match. Quote. I urge you to approach these chapters on nurture and socialization as though you were a detective unraveling a mystery. What you are tracking down are clues to your own wounding, the details of time and place and circumstance of who said what and did what to whom. You are trying to locate your true self in the tangle of your adaptations and to diagnose the trouble." End quote, Hendrix. When I was 14, riding the bus home from school, a boy asked me if he could cut open my chest, pry apart my rib cage with his hands and rip out my heart. Sure, I said, so he'd like me. He looked so much like my celebrity crush that he could have been his doppelganger. His name was Salvador, and he was one in a long line of the boys and men I called upon to save me. Not the first or the last, not the worst, not the source, just another crush. He said he was going to wait to open my rib cage. He says it's much easier to pry apart a rib cage than you'd think. I started thinking of him as the incubus, something I found on the internet. At night, I kept my bedroom window open and hoped he wouldn't come in with the spring air. Boy turned demon, broad shoulders as vessels for the unfurling of wings. I stood at the door to the woodshop classroom and watched his hands. If he had opened my chest, he would have found the hole, bigger than a heart and a stomach. I thought it was an organ, maybe the soul I had learned about in Catholic school and imagined as a limp gray sack. The hole had always been there, and when I was little, I filled it with Cadbury cream eggs. In high school, I used it as a hiding place for the NyQuil I drank from the Gatorade bottle in my locker. Later, I would keep all sorts of things in the hole. Whiskey, Vicodin, cheese, a butterfly knife, Nintendo games, teeth, boxed wine, antipsychotics, condoms. Salvador was expelled for knocking over a soda machine and threatening to kill us all. Quote, the issues of self paradoxically require relationship for resolution. The partnership itself is the process by which we reclaim what is missing. 
Aware of what our imago, our ghost partner, looks like, we know the kind of person we must finish our business with. We understand the issues we will have to face. An imago match partner has the potential to hurt us more deeply or to heal us. We cannot close our eyes to the imago. We must cooperate and work in concert with it so that we are not driven by it. Until we familiarize ourselves with the imago, even befriend it, we are in a waking sleep fated to repeat the same mistakes over and over. We get rid of the person who hurt us, but keep the problems." End quote from Hendrix. Tinder's founders liked the idea of the spark that starts the fire. My phone is a portal to an other world of strangers stretched out next to zoo tigers or scaling mountains. I'll never visit. The book says I'm looking for someone whose fingers fit into my wounds. The author thinks this is a good thing, a way to heal, but I won't know which wound opener I need by the species of fish he shows the camera. We have to meet. The author tries to coax me toward the site of my original wounding, but I won't go. A scene repeats in an infinite memory loop. In a bar with sticker caked walls, a man sits down. He looks just like his pictures. I know he can see the hole. I try to fill it with whatever he wants to see. I can see his teeth when he speaks. He drinks whiskey. I drink soda. I look at his hands and imagine them inside my chest. I swear he's looking at me like he's going to be the one who saves me. Quote, every second of our lives, we create our reality with our thoughts and behaviors, but we cannot change our beliefs at will. We cannot think our way out of pain, cannot override our instinctive reactions. We must become aware of the price we pay for our rigid thinking and we must experience the pain of holding on to our old beliefs. Hendrix. The day after Carl broke up with me, I saw a psychic in a blinds down building between the Cash America Pond and the discount gas station. She brought her brow toward mine and froze me. You were a man in a past life and you were a womanizer. That is why you are being punished. That is why they use you. I nodded. You are five years behind where you should be in love, she said. Did you know that? I nodded. You are empty inside, she said. Did you know that? I nodded. At a meditation-based sobriety meeting, a woman talks about the hole. I didn't know she could see it, but it turns out she has one too. She tells me she saw the hole once she stopped drinking. The only thing that can fill the hole, she says, is God. I don't even know what that means. When I think of God, I think of Catholic grade school and the laminated cards of Jesus opening his robe to show his cloth draped chest burning with a heart on fire, ringed with a thorn rope, staked down the middle with a cross. I imagine the hole like a yellow plastic ring full of iridescent bubble solution catching light. I try to keep God in the hole, but God is a bag of sand and the hole gets empty before it could get half full. I fill the hole with crystals, candle wax, handwritten affirmations, auspiciously shaped stones, tarot cards, spent matches, shells, photos of ancestors, herbs, astrological charts, shiny pennies, essential oils. I wedge a cauldron into the hole. The woman at the meeting says, we all have a hole inside us and we're supposed to show it to others. Mary, like her son, showed her heart, radiating light, encircled by roses, lanced with a knife. Every night I draw the same tarot card, three of swords a trio of blades through a red heart. I touch my hands to my skull and ribs. I try to find the hole so I can show it to anyone who will look, but my hands grow hotter and hotter against my skin as they search. The current rips down my spine and I feel it. Not a hole, but a channel, a tube filling with light. In my mind, I line up all the holes I've ever reached into, holes cut into everyone I've ever tried to love, and I just look at them. 
quote, where does the blocked energy go? The parts of us that are unacceptable, suppressed, ridiculed or unacknowledged. The fugitive self goes underground, as we will see, only to resurface in our Imago partners and in the conflicts we have with them." End quote, Hendrix. To make a paper fortune teller, you have to cut a piece of loose leaf into a square. Fold, 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 unfold, fold, unfold. Put your fingers inside, push out, write your desires and fears all over it. That is how I love. I give a soft boy the pen and tell him to write about his hole and how he thinks he can fill it. A paper fortune teller gets old fast. You have to move on, play mash, divine whom you're going to marry and how cool your house will be and how many babies you'll have. You have to keep playing until you get your perfect life. Some people don't identify abandonment as their deepest fear. I don't understand. When I sit down at a small bar table and take in a date, before he even speaks, I can tell how deeply he could wound me when he stays, when he leaves. This, the book says, is chemistry. Knowing he'll disappear and I'll cling because pulling away would let his fish hooks tear my flesh. To survive, I fold myself into the small thing he couldn't object to. I am the infant relying on her baby cuteness to evoke an adult's caretaking impulse. I curl my spine forward around my heart, stealing converse, steering conversations away from my accomplishments, asking, but how about you? How are things going for you? The thing a soft boy does must be survival too. As soon as I find his hole and insert all of me, he stops speaking, starts drinking, never leaves his phone face up on the coffee table while my mouth latches onto his mouth and my eyes try to read his mind, but his eyes shift to the side before his lids close me out. Can I really say his way of tending the fear is worse? Is hurting the one you love a worse offense than gouging out your own soul so you can stuff your brittle husk full of whatever you think he wants to feel when he delves inside you? Quote, to understand the imago and its seeming stranglehold on our will, we have to return again to our original thesis. Our goal in life is to return to that original state of relaxed joyfulness that we somehow remember, to feel alive and whole. In order to do that, we have to go back to the scene of the crime, to the place where we were wounded, in order to undo the damage and refine what was lost. From the perspective of our old brain, we must get what we need from the person or persons from which it should have come in the first place, or failing that from a reasonable fac facsimile. But childhood is over. We cannot run back to our parents to get what we missed. So we find the next best thing, a relationship that recapitulates in its vital aspects, the complex idiosyncratic pattern of our wounding and loss. The tool that our unconscious uses to perform this feat is the imago." End quote, Hendrix. In my notebook made workbook, jumbled memories refuse to connect like dots. The author says the remembering of childhood hurts will get us to ourselves, but I get to a mess of ill-fitting labels. My parents didn't fail. They made a house where I could hide out. The site of my wounding can't be reached because it disappeared under the damned river's water claw long before I was born into the nightmare. I took it in before a breath. If I never find what was lost, what then? Quote, at this point, you may be saying to yourself, but this is so hard, so tedious, so painful. Well, yes, it is all that. The path is long and there are demons along the way. And it would be nice if there were a pill you could take or a machine to wash the psyche clean. Alas, there are no miracle cures. But I assure you that you have control over your healing and the pain and effort of doing this work surely can't be worse than what you've suffered in difficult dead end relationships. Your psyche wants to survive and live fully. It wants to know that it is not going to die or suffer needlessly. It is just asking to be shown the way and it will gladly follow. This work is the way." End quote, Hendrix. I calcify into my mattress's divot. I believe the pain really will kill me. The hole offers to hold the pain. 
This, it tells me, is what it lives for. I keep pulling the death card, a skeleton on a white horse, armor clad like a conquistador, stepping over fallen and swooning bodies headed for sunrise. Death, sudden change, the old self's death, transformation, loss, failure, debacle, disaster, ruin, and beginning. The only way out is through the land of the dead, opposite land. The author says I must break patterns. So I take up my fencing weapon, open my third eye, cast releasing spells, summon friends with my mind while walking around the city, dress like the Virgin Mary in vintage robes, speak with the dead, pray over candles, get a second opinion from a psychic who tells me he is weak, Alyssa, and you are strong with the power in your blood. I heal myself with my own hands. I have no other choice. I was gaping in that bed. I could fill the hole only with work and energy. And even full, the hole remains. But now with him dislodged, I can see it isn't a void. It's a portal through which things can enter to make me strong. Quote, you will know you're almost to the gates of paradise when you feel like you are falling into the pits of hell. The demons, those voices from the past, arrive to frighten you away from the prize. Your defenses are crumbling. Your character structure is changing. Your worst fears surface as you violate the injunctions of childhood. The issues between you and your partner become more intense and your relationship goes into chaos. Despair sets in. You regret embarking on the journey and try to return down the path or better yet, get off the path and get rid of your partner as many couples do. But the gates are barred. Your psyche is reorganizing itself, returning to its original wholeness. It is hard to reverse the process once you've tasted the nectar of your original self. The breakdown is a breakthrough." End quote, Hendrix. I'm told to list the qualities of my ideal partner. No, first I have something I need to say. Fuck boys, you are not special. This is worse for me than it is for you because I'm the one stuck in a gif in which I sit in a bar and smile while you tell me about this one time you were drinking with your buddies and this one thing happened. I want you. I want to listen to your collarbones and lick the skin over your ribs and slide my fingers along your iliac crests. But I don't need you the way the women of my great great grandmother's generation needed the men who slid in and out of their lives after the whites hustled the Cascade people onto reservations, hanged their leaders, and upended the ways of living that had been shaped over 10,000 years. 150 years ago, the women in my maternal line learned to complete themselves because white men had broken the world in which men and women fed each other what they needed to become whole. Soft boys of Tinder, hear me. I have my own car, my own cash, my own large exotic zoo animals with which to recline. I cook my own meals, catch my own fish, write my own inspirational quotes. I am the substance I use to intoxicate myself, moving my bones for the mirror over and over, making and unmaking a cup of my collarbone and trapezius. I come from women whose dresses drip with the dentalium shells that were pulled from deep water and used like cash. I come from high status women with cradle board flattened heads, from women with their own canoes, their own land and the place where they'd lived for 10,000 years. Men of my history, hear me. When you talk down to me, fuck around on me, disappear from me, lie to me, that's an interesting perspective, but actually me, you disrespect a woman made of women knotted in a long string stretching back before massacre. The egg that would have become my mother was in my grandmother's ovary when her mother severed the cord. The first of us came from eggs the Thunderbird laid near the mouth of the river. I have my own blade, my own wings, my own lanced heart that might never heal, but will never need your salve. I do not want you badly enough to let you grip the rim of the hole, climb in, and leave it full of emojis and come. The hole is perfect, and you cannot touch it. I delete the app. That's it. It always feels so good to read that one. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you so much. Um, that was that was awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna give the mic to Mahesha. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome to hear uh, read out loud and just to to hear the the way you worked through it. That was that was great. So um, I have some questions for you, um, and it's just number one. I I have to say, like, I am such a big fan of this book. Um, I am such a big fan of this book. Um, it's got me reading tarot cards like every day, and it's. Uh, Yes, but that's not what this conversation is going to be about. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, but okay, so uh, my first question is, um, so I really love the way you uh, talk about narrative and narrative structure in this book. And specifically on, on page 250, because I've got my lovely copy right oh, here. I got mine too. Yes. Um, so on page 250, you write, um, ah, here it is. A story is a system of cause and consequence that builds sense from the incomprehensible. Settler, settler colonial stories take shapes like mountains and send us scaling the side, focused on the summit. And then further on you say, um, I've gone to the mountain. There was plenty of work to do, berries to pick. I, did not think, I didn't think about the summit. And I've gone to the mountain that destroyed its own peak and obliterated life with lava and ash. And so I, what I'm interested in is if, um, if you were to describe the shape of your book's narrative, if we're kind of moving outside of the, you know, the general like rising action, climax and peak, you know, how would you, how would you describe that? And how would you, um, how did you arrive at that shape? That's a great question. I actually, I have a blackboard. I just talked to my, my MFA students about this recently. So let's see whether I can. So I ran into problems with the blackboard because it's too short, but I'll lift it up <laughs> so you can briefly see it. So this is the shape of my book. Um, so I think of it, I actually do think of it as being a book that has a narrative arc. Um, I'll just lift it for a second to, to kind of explain all these elements. So it's in three acts. And um, on this axis, I have, I have years, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. Um, and so the, the pink line is the sort of emotional arc of the book. Um, and then I use this yellow line to chart um, the, the chronology basically of the narrative present of each essay. And there is a 100 page essay that goes through overlapping timelines of like four years or more. And that's represented by this rectangle. And then we exit. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, I, I thought of this um, originally the shape of the book was just like, you know, a bunch of piles of papers, you know, um, I didn't go into the writing process at the very beginning thinking about, um, you know, thinking, thinking about this as the book that it became. I was just failing at writing stuff for a really long time. I tried outlining a novel several times. Um, I actually think I have enough in outlines to make a full novel. Um, so maybe that'll be my next experiment, <laughs> just like, you know, a book of all my outlines. Um, I like that actually. Um, but, you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't go into it with the shape clear to me. Um, I was just writing a bunch of essays and eventually, um, in 2017, fall of 2017, I really, I started writing an essay that is one of the early essays in the book called Little Lies. Um, I just started by writing about this, um, this video that my brother and I watched when we were in the D.A.R.E. program back in elementary school, we have been haunted by this video our whole lives. And I mean, since the age of 10 or whatever, and we can't find it. Um, 
and that was, you know, just an obsession I started writing about because um, someone asked me for an essay for a, a, liter a literary magazine. And then I was just writing about all these things and I was writing about this relationship um, that had failed. And, you know, at the time I, I missed this person very much who um, had broken up with me a couple of years earlier or the year, the year before, a little bit more than a year before. And I just didn't know why I couldn't move on from this relationship. So really, I mean, the shape at that point was like, you know, the pink line just sort of moving in a way through this emotional experience of trying to figure something out. Um, and, you know, eventually I, I think after like probably six months of, of working on um, some of the earlier essays, eventually I really understood that a shape was making itself apparent. And I pulled in all these old essays um, that were sort of unfinished or abandoned or whatever, and I, I fit them in. So eventually, you know, I, I was I was in the process of shaping, and I think that right now I do see this as like very much a cohesive whole that has an arc um, that's like tracking the emotional experience of me trying to figure out like what is going on here? What is the, what is this magic I am looking for? Why am I seeing it in, you know, events associated with this failed three month relationship or however long it was, what do I need? What am I? And then, you know, it snowballed into like, okay, what do I, um, why do I keep falling for the wrong man? Why do I keep entering these, these patterns? Like, why do I keep cycling, circling? Um, and how am I going to get out? Um, so that's kind of, I think, the way I, I think of the shape of the book. I used the three-act structure with, you know, very deliberate openings um, at the beginning of each act to, um, to kind of invite the reader into thinking of it that way as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm amazed. Well, not amazed. I just love that you actually had like a visual <laughs> shape. That was that was wonderful. Um, best case scenario for that question. So, um, OK, so uh, reading reading White Magic, I uh, found myself getting a lot of recommendations for ways to spend my time. For instance, I downloaded Pokemon Go. Yes. Um, I'm looking forward to watching The Adventures of Mark Twain. Um, I have read Dead Redemption too. I've had it this whole time and haven't realized it, um, but I'm gonna play it. Oh, good. So, yes, I'm very excited. Um, but all of this to say, um, you're, and I love Twin Peaks, so I, I haven't watched The Return yet, but I watched like all the way up until The Return, and now it's something for me to do come summer. It'll be lovely. Um, but all of this to say, you work in a lot of different kind of like cultural aspects into these essays alongside like sweeping histories and family histories. And I'm, I'm interested in, um, well, I guess, how do you, how do you know when you've encountered something resonant? For instance, I was reading, as I reached the end of the book and I reached the Red Dead Redemption section, I was like, this is amazing but how did um i guess i'm curious about this this writing process for you how you kind of pull these these moments i think you know when i'm working on a book um and i'm always working on a book even if it's not the book that will eventually come into being i'm always in one book or another um and you know i think so when i'm when i'm working on something it's just always somewhere on my mind. Um, and I'm always in some way, you know, thinking, um, thinking about how these various things that come my way fit into it. Um, in the case of Red Dead Redemption, it was recommended to me um, because I talk about these things that I'm becoming obsessed with through the research process. So everybody around me knows what I'm working on. Um, and so it was recommended to me by a couple people um, because of some of the representations that were in the game. Um, but, you know, I think 
there's kind of like two buckets of these things. There's the things I begin like seeking out and experiencing that I pull in like Red Dead Redemption. Um, I think the prestige is an example of that too. Um, and then there's other things that are, you know, as I'm, as I'm working with these um, materials and memories, as I'm writing, as I'm putting things together, I'll think of something, you know, that um, feels connected in my mind, like the claymation movie, The Adventures of Mark Twain, or, um, I mean, most of the things in the book are things from the past. Um, I feel like, you know, I, I mean, I can't remember the titles of like most of the books I've read, but there's like this, I think that there's this repository in my brain, there's this archive that's like hoarding things and crowding out everything else. Um, so that when I'm writing, all these things can assert themselves. I think, you know, when I'm playing a game or, you know, you know, doing, well, right now I'm working on, um, a book that's about apocalypses. Um, just at the beginning, I just have like a couple essays, um, you know, in various stages of being done. Um, but I'm thinking about a lot of things. And so there's sort of a combination of like knowing what the topic is at the heart of it. So any video game I'm playing, you know, I'm looking out for like, is this for some reason, every game I want to play is set in the post apocalypse. Um, weird. Um, I was thinking it was a coincidence at first. And then I realized I'm, I'm, in, I'm responsible for this. <laughs> There's lots of games out there. Um, but you know, I will, I'll feel this tug of recognition. First, I feel the tug of obsession where I'm like, you know, wanting to spend every waking moment with this game or like researching this thing. Um, or on this discussion board. And then I realized, well, this isn't, this isn't a hobby anymore. Like this is part of my system of obsessions. Um, and then I start like collecting, um, taking notes, you know, saving tabs, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so then I guess I'd wanna ask, um, what system of obsessions brought you to white magic? Because um, I mean, like it, it's you know a book about you becoming a powerful witch, you know. Um, and I guess I'm I'm curious. So you've written multiple books, also. Um, that's something I'd like to ask about as well. Um, being someone who writes nonfiction, being someone who traffics in memoir, um, writing multiple nonfiction books. Um, how do you kind of constantly parse separate meanings from your life in that way um, to be able to get content for enough books. Um, you know, people always say someone's got a book in them, but you've, you've got three already. That's fantastic. Thank you. You know, I think um, with everything I'm doing, I'm not saving anything for another project. I'm, you know, I mean, some stuff is just not relevant, but if something seems relevant, if something seems like it's asserting itself to me as like something that needs to be written about it goes in the book it doesn't get postponed um you know if it doesn't seem if it doesn't seem relevant i'll probably just not be thinking about it um as you know i'll i won't be like meaning making or having realizations about it um i'll just have no insight at all into that part of my life um so you know i think that that's that's the the big thing about that like I I just treat every book as the as the only book I'm ever gonna write um and then um I'm, I'm forgetting your first question now um oh uh the the string of like obsessions that led you to begin oh uh, yeah of course um so you know at first I think you know I think there were there was like before it really took its shape in 2017, there was no obsession that I was really, I'm sure, you know, I had some, but there was nothing in my writing that really felt like it was pulling hard at me. Um, I don't think, um, I may be misremembering that, but I know that, you know, in 2017, I remember very clearly 
after moving to Ohio, um, I, while I moved to the Ohio, that was the original run of Twin Peaks, The Return. Um, so I got here, the movers had not arrived with my furniture and all my possessions yet. I bought a couch because I didn't have one. And it was just me sitting on that couch, you know, with my laptop watching all of Twin Peaks because I felt like I'd already been noticing all these like weird synchronicities that I track and, and report in the book. Um, and weird Twin Peaks stuff happening, you know, with my ex-boyfriend, like us ending up in the back room of a bar that I had been to before. And all of a sudden I noticed that it was the, the, the Black Lodge um, with the, you know, intentionally decorated that way clearly. Um, and there were all sorts of other things happening with that. So I just started, you know, with the Twin Peaks thing. By then I was, very deeply into astrology. I think it's possible it doesn't come through in the book because I know it's kind of boring for a lot of people, but I was deeply, deeply into astrology by then. Like, you know, I, I write about how with this ex-boyfriend, like, you know, he and many of my other exes were like not telling me everything. And I, um, could not get them to tell me as much as I asked. And so, you know, turned to astrology to try to figure out what they wouldn't say to me and what they were hiding from me. Um, and, you know, that was, I was really, really into that. Um, I got very deeply into understanding the ins and outs of charts. Of course, I, I you know, can't even begin to know like the beginning of, uh, of what, a, you know, an actual practicing astrologer knows. Um, but, you know, I got really deeply into that. And I think, you know, something that is, um, you know, shows up for me again and again is that, like, I think I do find, like, whatever obsession I have in life that's, like, very much a personal thing and not a literary thing, I find a way to justify spending all my time on it, you know, cause I am also a workaholic above all else. And so I always have to be working. Um, and so I have to find a way to turn, you know, a hundred hours of Red Dead Redemption into um, a project. Yeah, okay. I am certainly not uh, a workaholic. Uh, I will keep my video games and my writing separate, but I do love a good video game. I'm learning. Um, I'm learning the way. <laughs> um, do you think now would be time to take uh, questions? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Thanks so much, Myesha. Um, Thank you. I think yeah, Hira is going to ask the yes. question, one question that came through in the Q&A. Yes, first of all, thank you so much for um, sharing that with us. That reading was wonderful. Thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, what did you find most valuable about your time at UMD? Any classes or courses we should look into? Well, that's a good question. I was there from 2003 to 2007. Um, so I don't, I don't remember what courses um, you know, what, what specific courses I could recommend, but, um, you know, I mean, I've written, you know, an entire book about my time at, at UMD and a lot of it was really hard. Um, you know, a lot of terrible things happened to me while I was there. Um, you know, and I think they're not, I mean, I know that they're not unusual things to happen to women in college. Um, it's not specific to UMD in any way. Um, but you know, what I was, what still, you know, really strikes me is that as hard as everything was, um, you know, I, the academic experience was like so strong. It was such an important structure for me um, during this time when like I was pure chaos, like my life was chaos. I was just chaos embodied. Um, and I was having a really difficult time, like really, really difficult. But, you know, I really remained um, very focused on my courses. And, you know, I feel like I learned, I just learned so much about, um, 
kind of like a combination of, of things that I wanted to find and um, things that were offered to me that I didn't know ever existed. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't go, I didn't go into the college experience thinking of myself as a person who was going to be an academic for the rest of her life. Um, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't think of myself as particularly smart or, um, particularly capable of, um, you know, of doing intellectually challenging things. And I had, just so many professors over those four years who, who saw my potential and, um, you know, they simultaneously challenged me and also were really supportive and understanding and really flexible with me when I was going through crises. Um, it was just really, you know, an amazing experience for me. And um, especially now that you know, now that I'm a professor, I really um, appreciate the, just like that careful construction of a very challenging experience that's not like, you know, that doesn't break a person, you know, I was just like the, um, the way I was taught to read critically was so valuable for me um, and, you know, and continues to be. Um, and it was something that I really found a lot of solace in at that time. Thank you. Do we have time for another question or? One, one more question and then. Okay. I'll read them in the order that, um, ooh, a lot of good questions. Um, someone okay. asked, who is Hendrix? What do you quote from? Oh, Harville Hendricks, H-A-R-V-I-L-L-E. It's a self-help book called uh, Keeping the Love You Find. It's really good, actually. I really, I really, I love self-help books. That one's really great. Since that was a, a short question, I, I realized I skipped one more. It says, I find that there aren't many opportunities to write nonfiction, memoirs, essay in the creative tracks. How did you find the space and opportunity to write those kinds of stories? Yeah, that's a good question. I also see Sibby in the Q&A. Hi, Sibby. Um, Sibby's class, maybe two classes. I was in two classes with Sibby. They were so great and really instrumental for me. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, when I, so I went to my MFA right after college and um, I was a fiction writer in college. I had written one personal essay, but it was not at all the, you know, the thing I usually did. In grad school, I just kind of, you know, um, I started writing nonfiction while I was there. I cannot recommend the way I did it. Um, so like the way I did it was just, you know, doing whatever I wanted in my MFA program, which kind of defeats the purpose in my opinion now as a professor in MFA program. Um, I just kind of sidestepped a lot of the, a lot of the work. Um, so I won't really go into it. Um, I mean, what I, what I will say is that um, if you want to, if you want to write creative nonfiction, um, if you want to, the question has to do with studying it in creative tracks, right? Yeah, I, I think um, there are lots of programs, maybe not lots, lots, but there are there are programs out there um, where you can study nonfiction, including Ohio State. It's not an ad; um, it's a fact about us, um, you know. And so there's lots of um, information out there um, online now about MFA programs, and I would recommend, you know, I mean, this seems sort of obvious to me, but um, Maybe I think it, it might actually not be. If you want to, if you want to study nonfiction, go to a place with a nonfiction track. Like go to a program that is already built for what you want to do. Um, and you know, and up to that point, um, if you need um, instruction and you know and support before going to an MFA program or you know besides an MFA. Um, there's lots of online classes from places like Catapult. Um, 
there's plenty of others. I'm just not thinking of them right now. Um, but there's plenty of online classes uh, where you can learn from practicing nonfiction writers um, and you know get some instruction in those tools. And then finally, um, craft books like Tell It Slant by Brenda Miller and Suzanne Paola are excellent in giving you the language um, and you know the direction for further study. Thank you so much. I think that's a great place to end. Um, it was it was really wonderful. As I was anticipating, um, Alyssa, we would absolutely love to have you back in real life. So maybe even before the paperback release, anytime. We we we, you're always welcome here. Um, I'd love to come back. Yeah, and then we can do the the full writers here and now. You know have have dinner with students and um, have a classroom visit and that that is that that will happen I hope soon um, thank you again for your generosity and your insights and your reading um, thank you to to tin house for providing us with um, advanced copies of white magic that white magic comes out on April 27th. So pre-order it. Um, thank you so much to Maisha for introducing and moderating that lovely conversation. And thanks to thanks to all of you um, for being here with us. I wanted to make one reminder um, or just to tell you about our, our next writers here and now reading featuring alum to alumni Meg Eden and Marlena Chertok on um, April 14th at 5 p.m. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so um, much for having me. It was it was such a delight. So good to see you all. Good luck with your tour. Thank you. <laughs> and congratulations. Thank you so much.